My mother and father split up when I was about five. They divorced a little later. My mom wound up, well, they were both in the city for a while. My mom and me lived with my mom's sister and her kids. My brother lived downstairs because they were in a duplex with my grandma, with our grandma. So we all were together. You know, we were a clique. And then when my mom got with my dad, then we moved out to the suburbs and stayed in the suburbs ever since, except when I went to go stay with my dad or stay with my godmother. I started out in the suburbs in Chicago Heights, Bloom Township High School. And then I moved in with my father my junior year. And I wound up going to this crappy school, but it was because of the lateness of the transfer. I didn't have a choice. So I was like a year ahead easily than all the other kids. Inglewood in my senior year. And I wound up moving back in with my mother. And I was so far behind. Well, the school was tough for me anyway. I, I was very shy, very introverted, and very bullied. I hated it. What was Chicago like in the 80s? About the same as it is now. You mind your business, you're okay pretty much. Gangs were the same. I'm sure um, people, you know, getting hurt. There was probably a little bit less gunplay, you know, because people don't know how to fight now. People are scared to fight now. They want to, you know, I'm gonna, you're not kicking my butt. I'm going to go ahead and shoot you. But overall, as near as I can tell, it's the same. Like I said, I was in the suburbs and in the city, and I spent a lot of time to myself. I didn't have a lot of friends. You know, so I can't speak on a lot of things. My father is Polish. My mother is black. So moving, living with my dad, we lived in mostly white communities, you know, until we moved to Chicago Heights and that was mixed white, black and Hispanic, Mexican mostly. So it was, that was part of the problem I had fitting in because I was too black for the white neighborhoods and too white for the black neighborhoods. When I was in the second grade, we lived in place called Calumet City. The school I went to, there was like maybe five black kids, including myself. And I transferred in in the middle of the year. And there was some set seventh graders from the local junior high that were chasing me and trying to beat me up and hit, shake me down for money and stuff. That's when my mom taught me how to defend myself. Um, one of the kids, he was, um, he was in my class. He was the son of the local fire chief and he was this class bully and he told the other black kid in my class that he had to do something to me and I wound up getting stabbed in the leg with a pencil. I was like seven, you know. That's really when the race thing started, you know, when I really, you know, I understood it, white and black and all of that, but I was raised up with both. So to me, there was no differentiation, but that's when I realized. Even now, I'm almost 50 and I'm still too white. <laughs> you know, except the difference is, it's like, no, I'm not too white. I'm just too well-spoken for you. I was raised up in a musical family. My father is a musician and a, well, they call him a producer now, but he was a sound engineer, or still is. My um, stepfather, he's a musician, plays several instruments, just like my dad. I mean, my, like my father. A lot of people in my family sing. I sing. My brother sings. One of my other brothers plays a uh, trumpet, trombone. I can't remember, I was gone by then. <laughs> um, he did anyway. Only, only one of us out of, the, out of the four of us didn't do anything musical. It was wild. I didn't want no damn kids. I didn't like kids. I like other people's kids. I didn't want no kids. <laughs> You know, I'm not very fond of kids as a species. They're messy, they're loud, they're, you know, they stink. You know, they're loud and they're inherently stupid. They do stupid stuff, you know. I never, that's how I felt about kids, you know, and then I got one. It was hard. It was real hard. And I spent the first six months of my first full pregnancy being furious. And I wouldn't take him back for the world. He is so smart and so handsome and looks just like my father and he's just so cool and he, him and his, the his next one are always at the comic book store down on McChesney Park at 2nd Street or whatever, you know, they, they, they know my bar friends because they're always at the comic book store. <laughs> So when do you decide, what do you do after you graduate? I joined the Air Force. Why? Because, <laughs> um, this is embarrassing. When I was a child, 
I found out my father was a Marine. I also found out through sources, and to, the, to this day, he will not admit this, but through sources, um, I was informed that he left because it was Vietnam. So, but he didn't have permission, you know, when I was a baby. So at this point in my life, I had kind of gotten a measure of what kind of man my father was. And even though I was still daddy's little girl, I knew what, what he was about. And I decided I was going to be a better man than him. And I was going to join the Marines. And then I found out Marines had 16 weeks of basic training, running four miles a day, carrying heavy stuff. And I'm not going to be able to do all of that. The Marines emphasize they're not joining anybody, that it's tougher than ever to become a Marine, and that only men, not boys, need apply. Everybody goes through Lackland Air Force Base, San Antonio. With, Air, with the Air Force, there's only one basic training. Lots of tech, but, but only one basic training. When I was in basic, I was a chapel guide. I actually, when my, my original flight graduated, when I was supposed to graduate, I sang a song for them at chapel. You know, that was something I would never do, but they always liked to listen to me sing in the, the day room, you know, while we were polishing our boots and getting our mail and stuff. So I sang them a song before we left that I had learned in choir. I just had pretty white ropes, which was funny because I kept on doing that in, you know, tech training. And I also was on the drill team for the, for the school. And so I still got to wear the white ropes, but they were prettier white ropes with the white belt and the ring. Three, Take it out. seven, Take it out. oh, three, three. Seven. Was it predominantly males? Was it split? Was I think there... that there were three, maybe four co-ed groups, um, it was predominantly male, predominantly white, predominantly male, but it was starting to integrate nicely. You know, we weren't white and black. We were light blue and dark blue. And we were, the, the co-ed was the boys had their barracks and we had our barracks. There were a lot of people that had never seen a black person that wasn't on the Cosby show or a different world. Literally, they had never seen black people before. And to me, that was weird because, like I said, I grew up mixed environments. My godmother is, is white. My stepfather is white. You know, my mother's friends were black and white or mixed. You know, so for me, it was nothing. I'm, I'm used to it. I guess coming from Chicago, but people from rural areas, you know, they were like, I've never seen a black person before. It was kind of funny. I spent a lot of time once I was allowed at the swimming pool getting tan just because they didn't know black people could. I was black as heck. <laughs> Did you look back on the kind of the drill instructor who was tough on you? Do you think she bats well or do you? I think she meant well, but she's a little older than me. You know, I, I, when I was dealing with what I was dealing with, you know, learning about the race issues and, you know, like in the second grade or whatever, she would have been older. She would have seen more and known more. So I can, I can understand why she wanted us to do it, you know, but it's just the same way as parents today don't want to treat their kids the way our parents treated us. Me on the other hand, I, it works, you know? <laughs> My kids got treated the same way I got treated, if a little whiter, you know? But, you know, it's the same thing. She talked to you worse than others? Yeah, she had certain, she was mixed. Um, I'm not, I, you know, she was light-skinned and had, had good hair. So it's kind of hard to know if she was straight black or not, but she was harder on those that were black than she was on those that were white or other. But she went about it the wrong way. Also, oh, you don't throw a bed at an 18 year old girl. You just don't do shit like that. Pardon my language. You know, that's not the way to do it. I understand you trying to intimidate me, but you're screaming at me already. I'm intimidated. 
You know, my mother doesn't scream at me like that. Even my father, as abusive as he could be, didn't scream at me like that. You, you got my attention. Oh, you you just talk to me. You know, she was bad enough that a group of us actually went and reported her. Now, nah, things didn't really start getting interesting until after I got out of basic. I stayed at Lackland. It was crypto tech, is what we call it. The technical term was electronic communications and cryptographic system specialist. You know, I've never been the type of person who want to sit down and work at a desk. To this day, I cannot tolerate working at a desk. The closest I've come is call center work. I do not like it. I think it's a waste of freaking time to sit up and push papers. I've never been into paperwork. It used to make me go off. They made me do it, you know? Um, but it sounded interesting, electronics. I'm good at it. I didn't know I was good at it. Once I got past the mathematical aspects, once we got through the theory and started doing the physical, it was like, <laughs> and I was good. We fixed the equipment and then, you know, when we were at our base, we would have to go on call like once every few weeks, maybe, and go to the call center because somebody in the call center unplugged the damn piece of equipment so they could put a plug in the coffee pot. And now they can't figure out why it's not working. And I would have to get up at three o'clock in the morning, drive on base, plug in the dang old piece of equipment and go back home and go to bed. Not cool, not cool at all. My ex-husband, my first husband, um, he used to tease me because we were both based at the same base, you know, joint spouse. And he said at the comm center that there was a plaque there for a piece of equipment that I actually did fix, saying Airman Welch will fix this, you know? Don't touch this piece of equipment. <laughs> Once I graduated training and I finished my leave, I went to Langley Air Force Base in Virginia. Basically, it was more training. They always have you training. No matter what level you're on, you always have to train because you always have to stay on top of new developments and make sure that if you're not doing exactly the job you were trained in school for, that you remember how to do it. Like part of my responsibilities once I was no longer training and I was actually a regular member of the shop would be to go to other work centers and teach them or refresh them on how to do their job because they went to the crypto training, but they're in a call center or a work center doing something else that's only vaguely related to it. Um, I was sitting in a day room of my barracks, you know, and I was watching Headbangers Ball, and they had put a wall up in the day room, because we had the pool, pool table on one side of the day room, and we had the couch and the TV on the other side. They put up the wall because I used to play pool. My husband taught me how to play pool when we were still in San Antonio. And when I break, the ball has a tendency to go flying off the table. And we didn't want anybody to get their head busted, so they built up a little wall in there. So I'm sitting behind the couch, I'm sitting behind the wall on the couch, and I'm by myself, you know, and a guy in the barracks, he came in and he was pressuring me. He was trying to force me to have sex with him. And if I wouldn't have sex with him, to give him fellatio um, to the point where he actually literally had me hanging off the arm of the couch, trying to force it in there. And I'm just using, it was like he was harassing me for like 25 minutes. And only my quick wit in my mouth, you know, just kept him off of me. And somebody finally came in the room and he zipped up and went and talked to them. And I got out of there. I did report it. Um, it took a while, because after that I just went, to, I wouldn't come out of my room anymore. You know, and I would go and go to work and come home and stay in my room. And I was really good friends with the dorm manager, the one that decided to build the wall before I killed somebody. <laughs> um, and after about a month of me not coming out of the room, 
he came to find me and find out what was going on because that wasn't my norm. I was always, you know, there. My best friend, she, you know, I was always at her room on the other side of the dorm, you know, something. And they knew there was something wrong if I wouldn't talk to anybody unless they came to me. And I wasn't inviting nobody or anything. This guy had did this to my roommate and she fought him off until her boyfriend, who she later married, came to rescue her. And another girl in the room, he did it to, or in the barracks, he did it to her, but he actually succeeded with her. And they were supposed to support me and write statements about it. And the girl who actually did get raped was told me, was, I don't know why you're worried about it. It happened, it happened, you know, it's not a big deal. He's just getting his rocks off. And I'm sitting over here, you got raped and it's not a big deal. You know, he was drunk, he thought, just let it go. And my roommate was gonna, she was supposed to at least write a statement because she didn't want to stand up in front of everybody and testify. She didn't even do that. She backed out of it, decided to let it go. So I'm standing here on my own with a known serial sexual assaulter and I can't get any, any back. That really messed me up a lot. There was a lack of punishment. I dropped it. I did what a lot of women have done over the years and I dropped it. There's no point in pursuing it if you don't believe me and you're supposed to be on my team, but you're calling me a liar. Even though there's other people you know that this has happened to, then there's no point in me even going through it because I'm not going to get any help. You're not helping me. And that's the way it was for a lot of women in the 80s, even the 90s, even sometimes still today. Somebody does something to you and you get held accountable for it. You must have been doing something. You know, I was sitting there dressed like this thing here. You know, I might've had on shorts cause I think it was summertime, you know, but pretty much, you know, dressed like this. I'm not provocative. I'm not doing anything. I'm minding my business. I'm not flirting with anybody. I'm not drinking any alcohol, you know, but it's my fault because I've had sex outside of my marriage. Yes, I cheated on my husband. I was, I was bad for that, but you can't blame me. I didn't come at him, you know. How long did it take you to cope with it, to get back to as normal as possible? Months. It took months. Because it was like a couple of months that we were going through it. You know, I still did my job like normal and everything. I didn't let it affect my job. I let it affect me socially. Um, it took a time. It took time, but with some of my friends, I got past it. I'm never over it. I've never gotten over it, but I've gotten past it. Post-traumatic stress disorder. Post-traumatic stress disorder. Post-traumatic stress disorder, or PTSD, is very common among veterans. And We've seen a lot of stories about veterans and post-traumatic stress disorder. PTSD is a problem that can last indefinitely, but... This is an anxiety disorder caused by a traumatic event. I don't know when I started to show the signs of it. Something as innocent as this can trigger an episode of PTSD. The symptoms, the symptoms, the avoidance, the isolation, the hypervigilance, the extreme anxiety, irritability, inability to sleep, nightmares. I jump. I start off very easily. That's probably the biggest thing. Um, it doesn't take anything. Like I was cleaning up earlier, I'm cleaning the kitchen, and I'm cleaning the stove, and he walks in and puts his bowl in the sink. I jumped a little because I thought maybe the dishes had fell over in the sink. And then I turned around, walked right into him. I must have jumped like five feet in the air. You know, he's used to it. My ex-husband, my second husband, he thinks it's high freaking hilarious. It's not fun, you know, cause it's like, you know, give me a damn heart attack. Always scare me. His, his brother-in-law, our brother-in-law, his sister's husband thinks it's hilarious to walk up behind me and scream. You know, I have flashbacks sometimes, nightmares, you know, but mostly it's the high startle reflex is probably the worst and my temper, the mood swings. When you joined, what were the thoughts of your parents? Well, you know, my father was happy. You know, he didn't know my motivation. I ain't told him yet. If he ever watches this, he's gonna be like, this <laughs> You know, but I was I was a kid then, I'm not a kid now. Um, my mother, 
I think she had mixed feelings about it. As long as I had a phone, I spoke to my mother often. To the, like, I would, I'm surprised. Oh, <laughs> she hasn't called me because she'll keep me on the phone for like four hours at a pop. And I don't like talking on the phone anymore because A, I have to have this thing about privacy. I don't like anybody hearing me on the phone. And two, when you work in a call center for the phone company for six years, you don't want to talk to nobody on the damn phone. And she, she, you know, I used to talk to her all the time when I was younger. As, much, as long as I could keep a phone, long distance bills were ridiculous. I didn't care. Were you excited to get out? No. I liked my job. I really did. I liked my job. I did not like the chain of command. And I didn't always like some of the people that I dealt with, but I loved what I did. Why? Turns out I have a knack for electronics. I didn't know that, but I have a knack for it. I have a knack for fixing things. You know, it's like my talents have always tended towards book learning, except math. <laughs> Um, but it turns out I have a, I have quite a talent, or at least I used to, for hands-on work. And I enjoyed it quite a bit. I actually wound up finding a job doing electrical work as an uh, electrician's helper. When I got out here, I couldn't get no help. Not like that. I could get food stamps for me and my boys, but I was already on food stamps. You know, I already had cash assistance because of my, my baby at that time, my middle son then, He's my middle son now, but he was my baby when I got here. You know, he was six months old. There wasn't really no help for us. So Winnebago County, um, they have a thing, you know, and they're helpful now and they're like township, but there wasn't that much that I knew of going on back then. You know, and I talked, you know, they knew I was a veteran. I've been dealing with them since like 2000, 2001. I couldn't get rental assistance and stuff. Most of the people I knew that were homeless were veterans. I went to township and they're like, well, you're a veteran. We can't help you. I mean, literally, that's what they told me. There's a lot of things. The first time I really saw something happening for veterans was when um, they opened up the drop-in center. But that was the first time that I saw something done just for veterans. It was after that I found out about the stand downs. After that, that I knew about the Winnebago County doing the thing for veterans. You know, I mean, actually doing stuff outside of occasional help. It, things have changed a lot in the last six years, but before then, I didn't really see too much. I really wanted my boys to join. Teach is discipline. Um, it gives you a trade to put under your, your, your belt, you know, but I think it's a good thing. I've been through a lot of bad stuff, but I learned a lot of good stuff and I met a lot of good people. And it's a real small Air Force, kind of like it's a small Rockford. The Air Force seems smaller sometimes. I learned how to be myself. That was a valuable lesson. How to cut loose and stop worrying about everybody else's expectations, which is odd considering it's a structure, you know, but that was really important to me, for me. But it means a lot. It's the one thing outside of my children that I'm proud of. Don't follow the crowd. Do what's best for you. I told my kids all of this. I, I taught them two lessons in life. Be happy. Whatever you do, make sure it makes you happy. And make sure that if, if you're doing something stupid, make sure it's worth it. If it ain't worth the ass whooping, then it ain't worth doing. You know, think about the consequences of your actions. You know, be smart. Finish your education. Don't be like us old dumb women over running around here going, damn, I wish I would have.
you know, I took uh, an opportunity or two and threw it away. knows where I could have been. There's so many things. All I had to do was do my best. And I was lazy. Don't do, don't be lazy. I remember Mr. Stangy pulling me aside after class in my junior year and telling me that I, I had to take this class um, because he thought that I would be a good fit for the workload and he thought that I would be creative enough to make something good. I've never been challenged much at Harlem. Uh, my classes were always easy for me, but this class specifically was a wake up call that I needed to push myself further and I did. I pulled all nighters and sometimes spent like entire days just sat at my desk editing just to meet due dates or catch up. Like this, this class isn't a joke. I had never worked this hard in my life on something and it's rewarding to know that it benefits someone else and isn't just busy work. Patricia shared some very personal things that barely receive the light of day for a lot of women and I'm proud of her for speaking up about her experience and how it affected her whole life. After hearing what she went through, I knew that I had to finish this documentary for her uh, and her family and make something worthwhile out of it. Making this during COVID-19 was a massive struggle, and I wish I would have been able to meet uh, Patricia face to face while making this documentary, but I hope that her and her family can hold on to this video for years to come, and I, I hope I did her some justice.